Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here at Crow for another riveting session of Wildlife Wednesday. My name is Rachel, and I'm the Education and Outreach Director here at Crow. And today's subject is really near and dear to my heart because we are going to be talking about snakes. And I know some of you may be crawling in your seats right now, thinking about these uh, reptilian friends, but hopefully by the end of this session, you will come to understand why these animals are important and a little bit about what makes them so unique compared to other species of wildlife. So first and foremost, um, I know we do have listeners that are gonna be from other areas of the United States and possibly even other areas of the world. But here in Florida specifically, we have around 46 different species of snakes. Now granted, there are gonna be certain habitats and ranges that are different. So of those 46 species, down here in the southern region of the state, we get about 34 of those different species of snakes. Now, when you're considering all of the different types of snakes that we get here, there are going to be those that are considered either venomous or non-venomous. Now, the non-venomous uh, snakes make up the bulk of those uh, uh, species of those 46. So um, 34 are going to be down here in southwest Florida, and we also have four of which are venomous. So we have the uh, eastern diamondback rattlesnake, the pygmy rattlesnake, the cottonmouth or water moccasin, depending on how you name it, as well as the coral snake. And I will be delving into a little bit more about the venomous snakes here later on in the presentation but that was just to give you a little overview on the different species here. And uh, here in Florida, we also have the presence of what's known as invasive species of snakes. Now, an invasive species, if you are unaware and you're not from Florida, is an animal, plant, um, a plant or animal that has been introduced into an ecosystem, not originally its own. And so because of this, they are not interacting with the same types of predator-prey relationships, diseases, or limiting factors that help keep their populations in check. And so therefore, this uh, new habitat will allow them to outcompete native and migratory animals for resources. And Florida happens to be a huge hub for invasive reptiles because we have a subtropical climate. So it is ideal breeding ground and living area for reptiles, particularly for snakes. Now, not all of the exotic animals that get introduced into Florida will become invasive. An animal or plant is not considered invasive until it continuously reestablishes itself within that ecosystem it has been introduced to. So in Florida, um, we have a couple of different species of invasive snakes, but the one that will be the most well known to you all is probably the Burmese python. Now, part of the reason why snakes are uh, introduced so frequently into Florida's ecosystem is because they are a common exotic pet. Now, um, whenever you have exotic pets like snakes, uh, they are gonna end up living quite a long time uh, in captivity. So in the wild, most of your snakes will range somewhere between 15, uh, five to 10 years uh, life range on average, but uh, in captivity, some of them can get between 15 to 20 years. So some of the biggest ways to prevent exotic animals from being introduced into the environment is just by doing your homework and realizing the time commitment as well as the resource commitment you will be making as a pet owner. Uh, one of the ways in which you can either discourage um, animals from being introduced in the environment as well as to encourage responsible pet ownership is by looking for something called an exotic pet amnesty program. So that is a program that is sponsored through Florida Fish and Wildlife where they, uh, the government periodically allows people who can, for whatever reason, no longer take care of their birds, turtles, snakes, frogs, and you get to turn them in and then they will be rehomed. Now, due to the current COVID um, health pandemic crisis, the most recent exotic pet amnesty day that was scheduled for April has been postponed until a later notice. 
but other than that, somewhere between three to six times a year, FWC will host these amnesty programs and amnesty adoption days all throughout the state. And to find out where the next one is, as well as when is it going to be, uh, check Florida Fish and Wildlife's website. So taking it a little bit away from the invasives and back to our snakes in general, you know, why does Florida have so many snakes? Well, again, we are a subtropical climate. So um, by having uh, temperatures that are agreeable to their metabolism, by having the appropriate amount of vegetation and habitat requirements for them, snakes just kind of are pretty prolific in Florida. Uh, but unfortunately, as with many of our different species of wildlife that we encounter here at Crow, even snakes are now on a decline. And one of the number one reasons as to why their populations are declining is because of habitat fragmentation and habitat destruction. So again, homes, building projects, and so part of the reason why people may be coming more into contact with these snakes is because they're having less and less area to go. And some of you may wonder, well, why do we need snakes? You know, why are these slithery little creatures even important to being in the environment to begin with? And so uh, I want to educate you all by saying that snakes like owls and eagles do serve as a primary pest control. So they are a safe alternative to chemicals and they help eradicate rat populations all over. If you end up seeing a snake in and around your uh, residential area, it's probably because you have an unknown rodent uh, family that's living nearby. Because a lot of what motivates snakes to being in a certain area is going to be food motivated. And then the other thing that's really important about snakes uh, is the fact that some of the toxins and venoms that are produced from snakes and other poisonous amphibians uh, invertebrates and other organisms are currently being used in human medicine as well. And so then we kind of segue into their adaptation. So as with any other animal, uh, snakes have to have certain adaptations or physical characteristics in order to help them survive in a certain environment. But it seems like snakes are kind of getting the short end of the stick because they don't have wings so they can't fly from place to place. They don't have arms and legs, so they can't you know, necessarily grab or look for food or travel in the same ways as other animals. So really, how do they exist as a creature and continue their, life, uh, their lives here in Southwest Florida? Well, the first thing is gonna be movement. I mentioned they don't have legs, but despite this fact, snakes do have different ways of moving all throughout an environment. The first one is gonna be the concertina style, style of movement. This is going to be when snakes are climbing trees mostly. The, uh, the ventral scales or the scales on the underneath of the snake, they will actually constrict them and, uh, and expand them to climb trees. And so the concertina movement is usually when they're trying to scale uh, different types of vegetation looking for bird eggs. What we are used to seeing around here with snakes is going to be the serpentine movement. That is more of the undulating, um, the stereotypical one that we're used to seeing. And they're kind of moving back and forth. Uh, as snakes are moving through the environment, they're usually trying to find uh, different types of rocks or sticks or branches to act as resistance for when they're moving. And that sort of helps their muscles pull through uh, from one environment to the next. But if you do have certain areas that aren't as filled with tree branches and logs and rocks, and so the sidewinding method of movement is when you're usually using uh, sand. So if you just have access to sand, uh, that is when you're gonna do more contractual movement where you're uh, contracting your body and then you kind of sidewind moving it into a direction. But again, that's gonna be more commonly during sandy substrates versus earth and mulch and branches and tree logs. And then the final and probably least frequent use of movement is going to be the caterpillar movement, where instead of moving side to side, the snake is moving up and down. This is also going to be not as efficient of movement. It's going to uh, make it so they're not going as fast or as far. 
Next is going to cover the sense of smell. So a lot of us also, if you've seen snakes before, you see that they stick out their little forked tongue. So that is how they, um, how they detect uh, particles in the environment. So they pick up chemical molecules from the air, the ground, or water. And once those molecules are captured onto the tongue, the snake will pull that tongue back into its mouth and touch this organ. This is known as your Jacobson's organ. This organ then sends those chemical molecules to the brain, and then that is how the snake locates different types of animals like rodents to be able to eat. But this is how snakes have adapted their sense of smell. They do have nostrils at the front of their face, but that is not how they end up uh, picking up their olfactory sense or their sense of smell. Then we have hearing. Now, uh, humans have uh, earlobes. We have external ears or pinna, as they're known as on other types of animals. Snakes do not. Snakes do have little holes behind their eyes that do function as an ear canal. Um, but instead of them being fluid filled like mammal ears, they're actually air, air filled. Um, the, although they also don't have the external ears, they do have the inner ear function called the columella, which allows them to take in noises from the environment. But snakes also have another uh, way in which they pick up sounds, and that's going to be, surprisingly enough, through their jaw. So their jawbone connects to the quadrant bone, which is on the back of their head, which picks up vibrations in the ground. Again, usually from animals running away like mice or rodents. Um, and that, so they can pick up uh, lower frequency vibrations through their jaw as well. So it's pretty cool that they can hear with these little ear canals as well as with their lower jaw. Some snakes also have heat vision. So the uh, heat vision is gonna be unique to your pit vipers. Pit vipers have that little heat sinking uh, pit on the sides of their face that allows them to detect warm blooded animals that they are trying to eat. So bringing us to, you know, what do snakes see? We see snakes that live in the trees. We see snakes that live in the bushes. Some snakes even live in the water. So really, you know, what culminates their dietary choices? Well, snakes are carnivores, so uh, much of what they eat, or really all of what they're gonna eat is gonna be meat, and that's gonna be broken up between rodents, birds, other amphibians, and even eggs. Quite a few species of our snakes in Florida love eating eggs. Really, how do snakes eat? I know when I was a child, I was trying to figure out, you know, how is a snake able, able to eat an entire rat or a bird or an egg? And really, it comes down to the way their, uh, the biology of their jaw is. So humans have a mandible that is fused together on our lower jaw, but snakes are just, their two lower jaw bones are connected via a tendon. And so as they get a hold of an animal that is uh, bigger than their jaw, that tendon stretches around their prey item, and then they use uh, their, their jaw muscles to kind of help starting to force that um, prey item down their mouth. Now, when they eat food, uh, they also oftentimes, if they are a constrictor, have to wrap their prey item around and suffocate it until it is deceased. That is going to be a safety protocol for the snakes so that they have less of a chance of becoming damaged trying to enjoy their meal. Uh, certain types of animals also have chemical defenses. So the main reason why we have, uh, why venomous snakes have venom is going to be for eating purposes. So that's another thing that I want to relay to you all if, if any of you in our audience happen to be fearful of venomous snakes is that the venom that they have in their bodies is not intended to attack you all as people. It is meant to be a protective measure from them as well as a consumption measure. It takes a lot of energy and time to produce that venom and so you are the last thing that they want to end up wasting it on. Now whenever we're talking about venoms, there are going to be differences between venoms and poisons because I always get questions whenever I do these presentations in front of a live audience as to, you know, kind of how do you know the difference between one or the other. And for venoms and poisons, it's really just about the manner of delivery. 
So poisons can be transmitted to, uh, from one organism to another through touch, so absorption in through the skin, through taste if you are ingesting it, or if you are breathing it in if it's a poisonous gas. Whereas a venom has to be directly injected into the bloodstream via a bite or a sting. That's why we have the classification of a venomous or non-venomous snake, since it's the fangs and the, um, and, the, and the venom within the snakes that makes you sick, not just from touching the snake by itself. Now, leading into the venoms and poisons, I know they are scary and they are something that we need to have a healthy caution of, but uh, the toxins that are produced from some species of reptiles, mollusks, invertebrates, and snakes are being used to provide advancements for the health, uh, health field for human medicine. So even one of the symbols of the medical field is the caduceus, which is the staff with the two snakes intertwined around it. Some of the uh, medical properties of the toxins from the animals that I listed before include treatments for diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune diseases, strokes, hypertension, chronic pain, and even anticoagulants. Now with snake venom uh, specifically, quite a few of the advancements that have been done are related to uh, thinning the blood since that seems to be one of the properties that hematoxin or the pit viper venom tends to provide. So um, with the types of venomous snakes that we have here in Florida, we are going to have either the pit vipers, which is going to be the two species of rattlesnakes, the um, cottonmouth or water moccasin, and then the other species is going to be the coral snake. So uh, you wanna be aware when you are out in the environment, if you are in an area that does have coral snakes, that there are mimicry species that pretend to have the visual appearance of a coral snake to protect themselves in the wild. So just because you see a snake that might be multicolored, just leave it alone, but please do not automatically assume that it is a venomous uh, species of snake that can hurt you. Now, with the chemical properties of the toxins, with pit viper venom, hemotoxin affects the tissues and the blood. So that is the part of the body that they are going to affect when they are eating the prey. So symptoms of a pit viper bite might include uh, intense pain, swelling, numbness, and tingling, uh, rapid pulse or cardiac arrhythmia, uh, kidney failure, and vomiting versus the neurotoxin that is going to be more specifically to the coral snakes that is going to affect the nervous system so uh, adversely you're going to see, uh, see weakness or numbness at the uh, bite site sweating hyper -sal salivation difficult breathing and in some cases paralysis so that's how it affects their prey items when they inject their neurotoxin into their systems so the best way, if you are concerned, if you go out hiking route in nature, where you're gonna be more likely to come across snakes, particularly venomous snakes, is if you happen to be on a trail uh, or out hiking in nature, stay on any marked trails. Anytime you go veering outside of the pre-designated areas, you are putting yourself more at risk to encroaching on snake habitat. Uh, even if a snake appears dead, another good tip is never attempt to pick up any snakes, especially if you don't know what they are. Uh, uh, be aware that snakes do use uh, some of these trails as uh, uh, sunbathing areas too. So sometimes even on the pre-designated trail markers, you might see snakes sunbathing. Uh, and then do not wear any open-toed shoes when you are out hiking in wooded areas because if you do come across a snake by having the appropriate footwear, that will lessen your likelihood of becoming bit. If you do happen to be bit by a snake, but you are not sure whether it is a venomous or non-venomous snake, always call the Poison Health Hotline. They will be able to direct you towards how to uh, proceed with caution as well as to get you treatment if needed as quickly as possible. So if you are bitten by a venomous snake, call 911 and an ambulance to get you transported to the hospital because the sooner you receive treatment for a venomous snake bite, the better the outcome you're gonna have for yourself in the long run. Uh, remove any rings or bracelets. 
keep the bite below the heart, and finally record the time of the bite as well as any symptoms that you might be experiencing while you were getting transported to the hospital. Uh, being aware, you know, why, uh, where would you find snakes? Where are the quote unquote dangerous versus non dangerous ones? Really, uh, the snakes that you are going to encounter most likely in residential areas, more often than not, are going to be your non venomous snakes. So, those are going to be your more urbanized species like your uh, red rat snakes or corn snakes, depending on what you call them, your black racers, um, your yellow rat snakes, at least if you're down here in Florida. Uh, but otherwise, if you do tend to be more in, of a rural area, uh, keep in mind that snake habitats are really going to include anything with leaf litter, any holes or caverns, any burrows, or any trees. Because again, quite a few species of snakes also eat bird eggs. Uh, if you're trying to find out if, uh, if you want to see if there's snakes in the area, but you're trying to find uh, tracks, Unlike certain species of mammals and birds who might leave tracks or feathers behind, one of the telltale signs that you have a snake in the area, if you don't definitively know, is going to be a shed. So snakes do shed uh, their epidermis or their outer layer of skin periodically throughout the year. This is also known as ecdysis. So this is when they replace their old skin cells uh, this is going to be great for them while they're growing and it is also going to be a great way to remove any external parasites like any mites or ticks from them. Uh, whenever a snake is getting ready to shed, one of the first signs of that is going to be the uh, milking over or the more uh, cloudy looking eye. Uh, when a snake is going to shed, it actually starts from its facial area. It'll start peeling from around the mouth area. And then a snake is going to look for a tree branch or a log or some mulch and try to rub itself um, out. So it also, when the snake comes time to shed, it will come off in one piece, almost like you're taking a sock off inside out. So snake sheds are a great sign that you have a snake population in your area, even if you don't necessarily see one at that time. Today's uh, animal ambassador viewing is of Violet. Violet is an eastern indigo snake. Her species is the longest native snake species in the entire United States. Uh, full grown, these snakes can get anywhere from six to eight feet long, although six to seven feet is probably the average adult size. Now, the reason why we have Violet is because Crow is in a partnership with the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation um, to help uh, populate um, educational snakes in different visitor centers to educate about how important this animal is. Now, here we're getting ready to put her back into, their, into her habitat at Crow. So this cage it, uh, does have three different layers in it. Since this snake spends a bulk of its time in gopher tortoise burrows, we have the upper layer which she can sun herself, the main area here, and then finally we have the burrow area here which provides red lights so that we can see her, but she cannot see us.